Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our final spring lecture of our spring lecture series for 2021. Uh, my name is Carrie Soden. I'm the archaeological director and of the National Museum of the Great Lakes. We say this every time. This is the fifth time. Thank you all for signing up. This series has been extraordinarily successful. We have over 300 people signed up to attend tonight. Um, and we've also raised over $645 in straight donations. And so don't forget, if you really are enjoying what you're seeing and would like to help support that, please uh, go to nmgl.org backslash donate. So with that, I want to uh, kind of get going here. Uh, Christopher Winters is a freelance photojournalist and staff photographer at Discovery World Museum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He spent five years creating a vivid record of life aboard the venerable Great Lakes steamboat St. Mary's Challenger as she approached the centennial anniversary of her maiden voyage in 2006. Thought to be the oldest self-propelled bulk freighter in the world, the Challenger began her remarkable freshwater career around the Great Lakes as the William P. Snyder on April 28, 1906, six years before the launch of the Titanic. Mr. Winters was granted unprecedented access to the vessel by her owners and set off on a personal quest to record an old way of life in a brand new way, focusing revolutionary digital cameras on this revolutionary machine from another century. Centennial, steaming through the American century, was published in 2008 to wide acclaim and received the Steamship Historical Society of America's 75th anniversary C. Bradford Mitchell Award. As fortune would have it, the story didn't end there and doesn't end there. Uh, Winters continued to follow the former Snyder's remarkable career, recording her last voyage under steam in November 2013. Her conversion to a self-unloading cement barge at Fincantari Bay's shipbuilding yard, and then finally under the aegis of the National Museum of the Great Lakes, the transportation of the Challenger's historic pilot house to the uh, structure from the shipyard to in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, to Toledo, Ohio, aboard what is now the current Queen of the Lakes, the Paul Archer Gertha in April 2015. And so with all of that said, I invite uh, Chris to come on and um, um, and tell us all about it. And then, like I said, Chris Gilchrist will be here later to talk about our involvement, the National Museum of the Great Lakes involvement with this as well. So Chris, take it away. <clears throat> all right, well, this has been a merry, merry trip down memory lane, uh, putting this presentation together. I was laughing just before. I used to have all of this information in my head uh, for many years. I carried it around, and it's been 10 years now or more since uh, the book was published, and uh, I had to sort of refresh my memory uh, on, on some of the, the high points and low lights of my uh, once really once in a lifetime experience uh, documenting the the uh, life and times of the one of the most interesting I think most interesting uh, ships uh, to sail any any sea anywhere uh, uh, quite possibly in the history of maritime commerce uh, uh, anywhere it was a great story and uh, as you mentioned in your introduction. Uh, I would have imagined uh, you, you can, uh, some smart people have, have said you, you usually only get one big show in your life, one big project, one big book, one big whatever. And I sort of figured I had mine in the can and uh, I could not have imagined uh, in my most pleasant dreams that the story would continue on in the way that it has in the uh, intervening years, uh, and the story has has sort of flowered uh, into something uh, which is, I think, uh, I hope I'm right, uh, deserving of a, a, another book, uh, a sequel of sorts. I would never, I, I hate going over the same ground uh, creatively. I would not uh, have set out to do such a thing, but uh, as the story unfolded, uh, I find myself now at a point where where I'm pretty convinced that there's a second uh, a second book, uh, uh, a tale to be told, uh, deserving of a, a color. Of, I, I don't write book books, I write picture books. Uh, and, and I think there's been enough compelling uh, things that have happened that have transpired uh, to, to justify uh, risking my nervous system on, on uh, investing the time to, to create another book. So a little, a little background on me for uh, 
anyone who isn't familiar, uh, I'm a, I call myself, a bill myself as a Great Lakes photojournalist, which is sort of a loosey-goosey thing. Uh, I am a, I, I'm a commercial photographer by training. My uh, day job, such as it is, I am the staff photographer at uh, Discovery World Museum in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Here's a picture of our harbor back in the glory days. Milwaukee was at, in, its, in its time a very busy Great Lakes port. Um, I find this photo interesting because you can see the uh, schoonmaker off to the left there. That is uh, 1951, the winter of 1951, the very busy Korean War years. And uh, our harbor was host to uh, at least a third of the Great Lakes fleet uh, most winters. And, and uh, this particular winter, uh, which was somewhat unusual, they laid the schoonmaker up uh, in our Inner Harbor as well. So Milwaukee is a is a, a city built on water, and I was very blessed, uh, considering my interest uh, in in Great Lakes maritime history, which goes all the way back to I kind of skipped over this. Uh, I'm embarrassed about the haircut, so I, I probably passed over it quickly. Uh, this is uh, I laugh my. Standard joke with this photo is met anyone who's loved and been tormented by a boat. Um, and, and it has constantly cost money and let you down. Uh, I can point to the exact moment when boats sort of ruined my life. Uh, and this is it. In December of 1980, in the summer of 1980, uh, I, I bought a book about the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald and uh, I never looked back. It sort of changed the trajectory of my entire adult life in ways I could have never imagined at age nine. Uh, Discovery World, as I mentioned, is my day job. Uh, here is our building on Milwaukee's lakefront. Uh, and you can see off uh, to the left and right there is the F, uh, SV Dennis Sullivan, which is the only floating example of a traditional uh, three-masted Great Lakes schooner. And I had the privilege of uh, documenting her construction over a period of about 10 years. As the vol I was learning the trade, uh, I was apprenticing as a photographer in downtown Milwaukee when they were building the Sullivan between about 1992 and the year 2000. And uh, I volunteered as the uh, staff photographer of sorts and uh, followed the progress of the construction of uh, the Sullivan. Uh, sadly, much of that material was highly forgettable. I was uh, learning my trade, but uh, it was a remarkable thing to have spring up in the backyard, so to speak. And I count myself very lucky to have found a way to kind of combine my avocation and my professional life. Uh, the project got a lot bigger uh, in, in the early 2000s than any of us ever imagined a local uh, philanthropist got involved in a very big way. And uh, before we knew it, we had this uh, $100 million building on, on our lakefront. And I had a job as the staff photographer, which uh, is uh, like a dream come true for me. And it's also underwritten the cost of uh, pursuing the <laughs> decidedly, uh, uh, how to say, uh, Great Lakes maritime documentary photography is a lousy business model, as it turns out. And uh, working at Discovery World has uh, kept body and soul together and they've also been very indulgent of my disappearing on steamboats from time to time uh, to take photos. Our site, uh, uh, flip back here, our site, this is the current building, was uh, historically speaking the dock for many years uh, for the uh, Milwaukee Clipper which is a well-known Great Lakes uh, cross lake uh, ferry that ran from 1940 to 1970 in the passenger and auto trade. This is the Sullivan, uh, the, the kind of the boat that made all of the rest of this possible. Yeah, so uh, my career overlaps a great deal. Uh, my projects, I have about, oh, something like a dozen projects in my head, uh, stories. I follow stories uh, that I find interesting. And uh, my first book, uh, the first book that actually uh, came into existence was really the last project that I started. I, I, it went unusually quick. I thought, I thought, uh, uh, wow, I punched that out in five years. Uh, well, as it's turned out now, it's <laughs> if you add the second, uh, 
the second half of the tail, if you factor that in, it's it, it's been about as long now as, as any of the rest of my projects, which uh, often go on 20 years or so. Uh, uh, these are the five boats of the, uh, the Shenango Furnace Company. Uh, this photo was made in, if I recall, uh, 1912 in Cleveland Harbor and uh, shows all five ships. Uh, the Shenango Furnace Fleet was one of the, I, I think is, is pretty, uh, the, there isn't too much debate that the, they operated five of the finest ships ever built uh, on the Great Lakes. Uh, in, in the bulk trade. And uh, this is a very rare shot. Uh, uh, fortunately, the company had a sort of an ear, an early ear, I guess, for uh, branding, uh, public relations, uh, or, or maybe because it was a family company, maybe they, they just like to uh, uh, take family pictures. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm awfully glad they did. So these, th th these five boats, uh, were in, in their time, some of the, the, uh, the schoonmaker was in its day, the largest bulk carrier in the world. And the, uh, interestingly enough, the uh, Challenger, I usually use the shorthand Challenger because she had six names over the course of 113 years, 107 years, excuse me. Um, she was built as the William P. Snyder, the first boat in the uh, uh, Shenango fleet, the first of the five built in Detroit in 1906 at the Great Lakes Engineering Works. And she's in that photo. She sits uh, uh, to camera the second boat from, from the right. That is the Snyder and the Wilpen is next to it to the right. And the Shenango is in the middle, I believe. And uh, the William P. Snyder Jr. Uh, is, is next. And then the Schoonmaker is on the far left. And uh, so this photo just always stuck in my head. I had no idea how interesting, uh, how this would weave its way back into my life um, some years uh, later. This is the Snyder, the William P. Snyder, as I mentioned, uh, or as Carrie mentioned in the, in the intro, quite possibly the only ship. Uh, I've tried many ways to sort of triangulate this boast, um, po quite possibly the only ship in the history of maritime commerce anywhere. I think we can definitively say on, on the Great Lakes to operate in, in revenue service for over a hundred years. Uh, and, and here's a photo of her being uh, sort of fitted out in the Great Lakes Engineering Works uh, in their yard uh, in 1906. Um, in my trip down memory lane, this, this was sort of a painful, painful memory because I found these photos in the Library of Congress. I don't recall how. This would have been in about 2004, perhaps, and uh, thrilling to see. Uh, they, these were taken by the Detroit Publishing Company, which was a postcard company by one of their photographers. And uh, that collection now resides in the Library of Congress. Unfortunately, they were all done in, in traditional fashion in the turn of the century on what are called glass plate negatives, and uh, they were stored in this massive archive. So it was very, very expensive to have the uh, Library of Congress reprint these for scanning for use in, in uh, my book. And uh, I paid something like, it was like $1,700 to have, uh, there were four images from this series uh, to have them printed at a fairly large size so I could scan them uh, for, for maximum re resolution. One of the great things about this old technology is the critical sharpness is, is tremendous. So detail uh, is, is rendered very beautifully. Well, this, <laughs> the frustrating part is now, and not all that many years later, the, all of these images were digitized. I couldn't have seen that coming, I guess. And they are all free, free, free. Uh, you can download any of them now for free at, at a marvelously large resolution, larger than anything you'd ever need, presumably. And uh, I, I guess I was just a little bit too far ahead of the curve in, in this case. Now, these are also mystery photos, wonderfully interesting mystery photos uh, of, uh, as I was developing the archival section of, the, of Centennial, the, the first book, I, I, a friend of mine, uh, the first mate actually, had these images uh, in his collection. And they had been copied uh, with what is called a graphic arts camera from the originals uh, by a, a fellow who so, some of you may know, uh, Andy Laborde, who was a, a well-known boat geek from Milwaukee here. 
he was a graphic arts cameraman by trade and he had copied these images and, and Rocky, the <clears throat> first mate of the Challenger had them in his collection. And so my quest became, where do you suppose these images, where are the originals, where do the originals reside? Because not only are, are they terrific uh, photos, but they're sort of hand annotated, uh, as you can see in that sort of lovely uh, 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 Art Nouveau almost uh, handwriting there, and it gave some tantalizing details. Captain Slade was, as you can see in the lower left there, was one of uh, Shenango's uh, senior captains. And uh, it's difficult to tell from these images, that image of the engine room, it's, it's hard to see in the copied version uh, what, uh, if to sort of confirm that that was in fact the Snyder's engine room. Well, once we found the originals, it turns out it actually is. You can read the engine number. The photo is so clear that uh, you can read the uh, builder's plate on the engine and it is in fact the Snyder's, uh, Snyder's engine, triple expansion engine that she was built with in 1906. These photos were all taken about 1912. My guess would be, I don't know this, but my guess would be they waited, but their, bo their big boats came out in 1911, 1912, I think. and. Uh, they then uh, brought on uh, someone who was obviously a professional uh, and they did a series of uh, uh, really terrific series of photographs uh, of their ships and, and also on their ships, which is pretty rare, a pretty rare thing, not only interior photos, but well done. Uh, it, that was not an easy thing. Interior photos in, in this era was not an easy thing uh, on a ship, especially uh, to, to pull off and uh, what a lucky thing. Uh, that the company uh, felt that was something uh, worth investing in all these years later. So these photos sort of haunted me for years. I never did find the originals. I did the book. I had to do all sorts of voodoo to the the uh, or to the copied versions to make sure that they reproduced uh, reasonably well. And uh, I thought that was the the end of it. Uh, well, as it turns out, uh, uh, it really wasn't. And uh, that that little uh, uh, what I thought was a dead end sort of uh, sort of came back to life in a, in a really compelling way. So the Challenger, for lack of a, for lack of going through six different names, the Challenger uh, was sort of a, what struck me about the boat as a as an enthusiast and as a as a photographer was she was uh, because of the nature of the trade she was in at the end, which is to say the transportation of Portland cement uh, to and from the, the manufacturing plant in Charlevoix, Michigan. In this photo here, you can see that uh, slip, the loading slip at Charlevoix. Uh, uh, cement, Portland cement, which is sort of the glue that holds uh, concrete together, is the second most used material in the world, second only to steel. And uh, it's kind of a finicky cargo. It can't get wet, obviously. And uh, Cement was sort of a commodity that came late on the scene in the bulk trade on the Great Lakes. So a lot of the, the terminals are kind of up these small tributary rivers uh, that, where the real estate was a little more available. So the fact that the Challenger was sort of obsolete in the bulk trades, the iron ore and coal trades by the 1960s, uh, was not a, a death sentence as it was for most of the other ships of her era, or virtually all of them uh, eventually. She was converted in, in 1967 at the Manitowoc Shipbuilding Company to operate or to uh, operate in the cement trade and, and handle that uh, powdered uh, product uh, with a, a sort of a novel air slide system that made her supremely efficient. Uh, even though her hull was, was quite old at that point, uh, uh, 60 years old, um, her cargo handling equipment uh, it was like four or five times faster than any of the rest of the boats that were operating in the cement trade. And as a consequence, she survived like some sort of the Jurassic Park dinosaur that sort of uh, after, after every, every other creature was extinct, uh, she sort of hung on and on. And uh, I don't know that anyone else was, uh, you'd have to, you have to be kind of a, at least initially you had to be sort of a nut to uh, appreciate why? Because she was a fairly unremarkable ship almost from the get-go. She was quickly, she came out in 1906 and was sort of a big deal, but she was quickly overshadowed by other vessels and even her own sister ships or, or fleet mates, uh, which were much larger and much more celebrated in their day. And she kind of uh, trucked on in relative obscurity for 80 years. Uh, she was probably best known in the world 
uh, dubiously perhaps as the, uh, the Chicago River Jink ship. Uh, she was for many years the largest vessel probably ever to transit the uh, North Branch of the, regularly at least, to transit the North Branch of the Chicago River. She'd go all the way up to Goose Island on the North Branch uh, to the Pin Dixie silo there. And uh, she was sort of infamous for freezing the bridges with malfunction for inexplicable reasons as she was making that transit. And it would create absolute chaos, uh, as you might imagine, for the uh, downtown traffic. Uh, so that was sort of her claim to fame uh, uh, at the, uh, in, the, in the later years of, of her life on the lakes. Um, I came across the boat. Uh, she, I was aware that uh, she, she was the oldest uh, ship trading at that time uh, in the early uh, 2000s. Uh, the, EM, the cement boats lasted the longest, much longer than any of the other uh, trades, uh, vessels in any of the other trades because of that very unique cargo handling system and the fact that uh, both loading ports and ports of call were, were, were in these sort of tight, small, uh, restricted spaces. So smaller vessels were actually preferred uh, as opposed to that being sort of a fatal uh, limitation. So I was aware of the boat. Uh, it occurred to me that uh, that was you know, if the, uh, one of the other cement boats uh, in the trade, uh, the EM Ford, traded for 96 or 98 years, 96 years, 98 years, and then was laid up <clears throat> as a, st a storage hull in Saginaw, I believe. Uh, so she didn't make the 100 year mark. And uh, I was shooting, uh, uh, sort of coincidentally, I, I have done a lot of shooting at the, the, the shipyard in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin over the years. And I was working on a story for Seaway Review magazine about the old Mackinac, the classic uh, Mackinac, the icebreaker. And uh, I had gone up there to the, she was in a the, uh, shipyard for her last yard period of her career. She was being retired in 2005 and replaced by the, uh, the new Mackinac. So I knew she was in the dry dock uh, and I knew that was probably gonna be my last chance to get some detail shots of this. She had a kind of a unique bow propeller so I went up one night in uh, 2003 in July and uh, went up on the gantry crane, got my shots. And then, uh, as luck would have it, this appeared on the horizon. The Challenger came in for her five-year survey that same night and uh, took some shots. And it occurred to me that uh, a five-year survey is not cheap. Uh, and she was 98 years old at that time. And assuming she passed the inspection, uh, it was entirely possible that she would become the first vessel to uh, break that hundred year uh, plateau or uh, barrier. And uh, so I got pretty ginned up about that. And I, I came back, I drove home, came back with some different equipment the next day. And I took these two images uh, in the dry dock once they had, uh, they had her on the blocks. Maybe it was a couple days later. Uh, and as you can see there, uh, it's pretty unique. Uh, it's uh, sort of, uh, very rare now uh, that uh, what they what they call the counter stern and the lapped and riveted uh, uh, shell plating from 1906. Uh, the, the boat was well cared for all those years. Her bottom had been progressively replated. You can actually see them working on that in the photo on the right. Uh, so she was for her age. Uh, she was actually in, in reasonably good shape. She passed her five year and uh, it occurred to me that uh, this is a pretty good story from the get-go that uh, now the stage was set and uh, I took two more shots later in the day down in the engine room. And I was doing this in, in sort of old school fashion with a, what's called a view camera and large uh, sheet film, uh, which was the way you did it. My career spans the quantum shift from, from film-based photography to digital-based photography. And I was trained in the old way. And so I did these initial images with a large, format camera, much like Ansel Adams would have, or Matthew Brady for that matter, during the Civil War, it's the same machine. The film stocks had gotten a little better, the uh, film emulsions had gotten a little better, but the basic machinery was unchanged for something like 150 years. The problem uh, I encountered was in order to get an image on, on that sheet film, which was a very, produced a very high quality image, but you needed a tremendous volume of light, which doesn't exist in engine rooms as a rule. So I had to supplement the uh, ambient light in there with my strobe packs. Uh, and I did not understand 
the complex and ancient and arcane electrical system of the St. Mary's Challenger, which is this sort of DC <laughs> freak of nature. And I blew all the fuses with my packs and uh, I, the engineers were on edge already. Uh, and uh, I you know, apologized and, and everyone was kind enough to not throw a wrench at me. And I got my two pictures and, and uh, departed uh, in a cloud of profanity probably. And uh, uh, sent the images down to the fleet office. Uh, Hannah Marine was managing the boat at the time. And I said, hey, this is, this is something I want to be a part of. Uh, is it possible? Would it be possible? Uh, I have this new G-Wiz digital camera. Could I, could I ride along on the boat and sort of document life afloat uh, as the ship runs up to its 100-year anniversary, which uh, in my weird little world is a kind of a, a special and important uh, thing to witness. So uh, fortunately, uh, a true... The gentleman, steamboat geek extraordinaire, was the uh, VP of operations at that time, Ed Hogan, my original patron. And uh, he said, sure, kid, that's weird. But if you feel like it, yeah, come along. And, and uh, I never looked back. I started in, in earnest in November of 2003. And, and it, I shot nonstop uh, all the way through the, the centennial season in 2006. And this image, uh, this is the Five Bridges area. Uh, of the uh, Calumet River down in South Chicago. This was the moment that I knew that things had changed forever uh, in the world of photography. This picture was taken at about five o'clock in the morning on a bridge uh, that was being buffeted around by buses and cars rattling over it and uh, would have been absolutely impossible in the age of film uh, to, to be able to make an image of a moving target on an unstable platform uh, in the virtual middle of the night, it was like science fiction. And uh, I came back and processed this thinking, holy smokes. And this camera was a was an embarrassment by modern standards. Uh, this was the Canon 1DS Mark I. It was 11 whole megapixels. My iPhone is bigger now, uh, in terms of, at least in terms of the megapixel count. But it was uh, light years beyond what you could do with the uh, the traditional E6 based uh, slide film I had been working with professionally. So this was, there was this sense of being in the right place at the right time with the right tools and a really good story. And it was, a, it was a, from, from the get go, I remember thinking this is, this is it, this is the thing. And uh, I kind of operated uh, as if that was the case and, and had a sort of uh, damn the torpedoes uh, approach uh, from from day one, and that is easier to say than to do. For instance, the shot is down where the uh, the boat goes through that five bridges area in the, in the Calumet and clears another seven or eight bridges on the way to this terminal, which is down on Lake Calumet. And uh, I thought, well, that'll be a neat picture. And one great thing about cement boats is they always deliver to these big tall silos, and so you don't need to charter an airplane to get a sort of an aerial view. And I parked myself up. This was early in the project in December of like 2003. And uh, so I, I talked my way up on top of the silo and I was unfamiliar <clears throat> at that point with the unreliability of steamboats and bridges in the winter time. And so I sat on this silo top from early morning and I was knew it that the, <clears throat> the business of stalking steamboats. So I, I thought, well, I can't come down, I'll miss it. And uh, so I sat there until, as you can see in this photo, the, it was sundown finally when the boat came around the corner. And I, it's one of my favorite pictures, but I suffered a good deal, uh, practically uh, hypothermic by the time I actually got the pictures and got the hell out of there. Uh, these are some other favorites from the book uh, coming into Manitowoc, uh, Wisconsin. During her uh, centennial season there, you can see the still steaming uh, sort of uh, celebratory uh, billboard lettering across the focusal there. The shot on the left is the one everyone likes, even if you're not into boats, something serene about it. I suffer uh, a great deal for pictures, and that's what I took in my underwear in my cabin. That's the one everyone likes, so I find that sadly ironic. This is the plant at Charlevoix. This was another hellish experience trying to get this shot, and I, I must thank, if anyone out there from Discovery World is listening, I, I must thank all my colleagues over the years, because I recall this very clearly. I had set up this shot with the pilot, with a charter pilot in Charlevoix, 
And I was going to have to drive to Charlevoix from Milwaukee, meet him, get up in the air and meet the boat, uh, hopefully at a decent hour of the day on a clear sunny day, et cetera, et cetera. And then they had some issue with the unloading system and they were delayed uh, indefinitely. So I, the whole the wind, the air went out of the whole shebang. And I thought, well, it'll be a couple of days and I'll just try it again next week or next month or whatever. And I went, <clears throat> I threw in the towel and I went across our home bridge, across our harbor to get some frame stock or something. I kind of picked up my day and, and uh, well, sure enough here, I go over the bridge and there's the Challenger leaving. Apparently it wasn't a very serious repair. And so I, I never went back. I happened to have my camera in the car. I never went back to work. I just kept driving and I drove to Charlevoix and, and uh, I got this photo. It all kind of came together rather beautifully. Yeah, the, the water in that area is, is quite lovely uh, as you can see. And uh, I happened to put the plane and the boat and the weather all in one place uh, to get a picture. Now in the age of drones, this would probably be a lot easier to do. Uh, wonderful human stories. This is the first mate who I mentioned who became a very good friend uh, over the years, still is. Uh, he's a, a museum caliber scale model builder and was building a uh, replica of the Challenger in his cabin during his off watch hours. Uh, this part of the story carries on too, interestingly enough. I'll touch on that a little later. Some wild weather uh, coming through the very, it's already sort of a hairy place to navigate uh, right below the Blue Water Bridge on, on the St. Clair River high current area. And we had this massive thunderstorm roll through right as we were coming under the bridge. And uh, that digital camera was able to bag it and uh, then get soaked. It was just like a typhoon. I got completely soaked. I was up on the roof of the deck house and uh, didn't bother the camera, which shocked me. I thought I was. I had cooked my goose, uh, so to speak. Here's the morning of the 100 year, uh, April 28th, uh, 2006, the uh, 100 year anniversary of her maiden voyage. Uh, load and cement, Charlevoix, just like every other day of her life for the last 40 years. Uh, I tried to gin up a whole lot of interest in the local media and whatever, and I got absolutely no interest from anyone. But uh, I was glad to be there with the camera, and I was glad the weather gods uh, smiled on us that night, or that morning, rather. Uh, this was the, the Centennial Load was a Milwaukee Grand Haven split coming into Milwaukee here. You can see how tight that river is in this photo. Uh, that a, The boat just barely fits up in there, and that is why. Uh, uh, boat survived as, as long as it did. A small ship is actually uh, the only sort of uh, ship you can get up the Kinnikinnick River or the Manitowoc River or, or the Grand River. So another, uh, this was just sort of, this was the, uh, one of the uh, sort of cover shots, uh, just one of my all-time favorites. I threw it in there just for a trip down memory lane coming into South Chicago, all that industry, which is interesting because it's all gone now. Much of it's gone. Uh, KCBX is gone. All the blast furnaces were still up. They were defunct when I started, but they were all gone by the end of the, the project. Uh, so a lot of that, that was just, uh, it was the biggest steel producing region in the country uh, for many years. And uh, it was just an absolute cradle of industry and it's all gone. Uh, there's a couple of cement silos, uh, stone plant and a few other odds and ends, but uh, it is all vanished, which is, I suppose, sad, but also inevitable in some way. So the book came out in 2008. I finished my pictures in 2006. It took another year to learn how to build a book, which is something I could do a whole talk on unto itself. And then the economy crashed, if everyone remembers, in 2008. And uh, well, then Fade the Boat, which is already quite old and uh, and, and uh, kind of hanging on by her, the skin of her teeth. Uh, the, fate, uh, the future didn't look super promising, uh, but they towed it in. Uh, she was due for another five year in 2009. So they, they towed her into the dry dock at uh, Bay Ship where I found her originally. And she passed uh, once again with flying colors. Uh, and so she had many good years, seven uh, good seasons after the centennial uh, season. This shot was, uh, we, my wife and I would take a trip just for old time's sake uh, after the book came out once a year. And uh, a friend of ours, uh, Lou Gerard, took this photo. We were on the boat. He was on the bridge and uh, just a lovely picture of a sunny morning in South Chicago. Here's my darling bride on the boat. We had many fine, we tried to go around the 4th of July and just have a sort of a steamboat 4th of July. And uh, this was one of the more memorable years. 
It's the only place I'm allowed to smoke cigars on a regular basis anyway. Uh, that particular 4th of July, we came in right at the same time the Badger uh, was arriving. So you have the two, uh, two of the only uh, Skinner powered engines, uh, Skinner powered vessels in North America uh, entering Manitowoc Harbors uh, practically simultaneously. These are those mystery photos I referred to. And uh, now we'll get on to the new part of the new business, if you will. Uh, this is our uh, uh, a tremendous photo of the William P. Snyder Jr., which was the big sister to the, cha to the challenger, William P. Snyder. And of course, our fabulous uh, Colonel Schoonmaker uh, was virtually a twin. Uh, I'm sure Paul Lamar would probably say that's not exa exactly true. But uh, these two boats were, I would wager, uh, as, as something of a connoisseur, that this, these two boats, the Snyder Jr. and the Schoonmaker, were the finest lake boats ever built, bar none. Uh, and what a lucky thing that uh, the museum and, and uh, a couple of very dedicated individuals uh, saved the boat from a sort of ignominious end. Uh, the vessel had been donated to the city of Toledo in the 80s and had sort of fallen on very hard times. Here's a photo of it in its sort of bleached bone, dead whale sort of phase at the end when the city was uh, taking soliciting bids for scrap to just get it out of here. We don't want to look at it anymore. And I'm not going to go into the story of saving the schoonmaker because that's a talk Paul Lamar should give because uh, he knows the whole story. He is the guy. Uh, I, I have observed over the years that these sort of projects usually turn on a handful of very dedicated individuals, dedicated often to sort of lost causes. And uh, this surely from the outset seemed like a lost cause, but it did not turn out that way. And as a consequence, we have a, a whole new chapter in the story. Uh, uh, to tell. And I was lucky enough, I had met Paul uh, in, in researching for the book. Uh, he was pointed out as the Shenango guy. So I looked him up and uh, asked him a whole bunch of pesky questions initially. And then I started, he invited me to come along with the camera, which I did as they were slowly rehabilitating the, uh, what was then the Willis Boyer, uh, which was, uh, as you can see in these photos, a popular spot for fireworks on the 4th of July. And uh, uh, over a period of, uh, I'd have to ask Paul, again, he should tell the story, at least what was it, five, six years, they uh, completely restored at least the exterior of the vessel to its former glory as the, uh, the Colonel James M. Schoonmaker, uh, the, the queen of the Shenango fleet, brought her back into her her uh, Shenango green and hull and then that beautiful orange uh, boot top uh, back into our uh, original livery. Let's see if I can find a photo there. You can see that beautiful forest green hull and, and the, the orange boot top, which was unique on the Great Lakes. Uh, this is christening day, rechristening day, July, July 1st, uh, 2011, which was 100 years uh, after she had come out on her maiden voyage. So now you have two ships in the same fleet that both uh, eclipsed 100 years, which again, uh, as, an, as a, a very a sincere nerd, I was really uh, uh, jazzed by that. And, and what, a, what a story to tell. Uh, th this is again, the, that same rechristening day. And, and uh, this is where the story continues to, to become even richer. Uh, the, me the older gentleman getting on the boat there is William P. Snyder III, the third generation, the grandson of William P. Snyder, for whom the Challenger was named, got wind of the project uh, and uh, probably due to Paul's uh, uh, efforts uh, and he got really excited about the, he, he had come in to the family business sort of at the end of their uh, how to say their uh, the, their steel making days. Uh, they they had a an integrated steel making company. They had their own fleet, and uh, he came on the scene kind of as that was wrapping up, and they they were exiting the business. But in spite of that, he 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 kind of I I think uh, he had a lot of fond memories of those days and of his father, and uh, so he he got uh, excited and got involved in the project, and uh, that yielded not only just from an historic standpoint, a wonderful sort of living connection to all of this history. Uh, but as uh, Paul got to know Mr. Snyder better, uh, eventually he was invited out to the family uh, estate. Here's some more christening day photos here. Uh, and that is Ding, uh, next to Chris Gilchrist, there is Ding Schoonmaker, who I 
can't say, great grandson maybe of, of Colonel Schoonmaker. He was also a fairly famous uh, sailboat racer and uh, unfortunately passed away not all that long ago, if I recall. So Paul now is invited out uh, over a period of uh, years uh, to, to uh, visit with Mr. Schneider at the family home, the family estate, uh, Wilpin Hall out in Pennsylvania. And uh, on the third floor of this estate where the servants used to live uh, is, is uh, the corporate archives of the Shenango Furnace Company. And we should roll through these uh, shots. This is now moving the bullet, which was a, I'll come back to my, my uh, Wilpin Hall story in a minute. This is uh, an important part of the tale, of course, moving the boat from her old dock there in Toledo under the bridge down to the uh, slip at the national, the new National Museum of the Great Lakes. Those two efforts sort of dovetailed and uh, uh, the boat was moved to its slip. Uh, this was in October of uh, 2012 uh, down to its uh, current uh, spot there on the river. Uh, in what I think was the old coal slip there adjacent uh, to the museum. So some of these images, uh, I was on the boat, uh, these color images uh, off the boat were taken by the, uh, the dearly departed and, and uh, sorely missed uh, Jim Hoffman uh, took these and shared them with me uh, for this project. One great thing about what I do is I get to collaborate. I have an excuse to collaborate with a lot of really fabulous people. And here's a shot Paul took with his drone of the schoonmaker in her new slip uh, when the uh, landscaping was, was wrapped up there at the museum. So the, the tale now kind of comes together, the tale of the schoonmaker, the tale of these old fleet mates uh, kind of being brought together after a hundred years of history. Uh, I mentioned Mr. Snyder visits to Wilpen Hall to the attic, which is sort of like Indiana Jones going into the cave. And uh, well, it turns out they have all, I mentioned uh, all of these professional photos that I had been searching for the originals of. Well, guess what? They're in the attic at Wilpen Hall. And uh, so in addition to this wonderful contemporary stuff about saving the, scho the schoonmaker and the kind of the end of days for the challenger is this incredible trove of archival images uh, taken by, uh, we don't know who, uh, for the Shenango Furnace Company. Uh, and uh, this, uh, just a great, that's the Snyder, probably 1909, 1910, uh, on Lake St. Clair. Here she is coming into Duluth Harbor, it's probably around 1912, when that uh, big shot was taken uh, of the five boats together, when the bridge was still, uh, uh, I forget what they called that uh, car that used to go back and forth across the bridge. Uh, the Wilpen was the only vessel ever on the Great Lakes to have a, a uh, orchestrian organ, which I finally done some research on. I could bore you for 15 minutes about what an orchestrian, a steam powered orchestrian organ is. I won't do that, uh, but uh, the Wilpen had one, the only boat before or since ever to have an orchestrian uh, organ, which was replaced not all that long after by uh, gramophones and, and the radio, of course. The Shenango boats had radio, actual shortwave radio, which was quite rare on the Great Lakes. This photo was in that album. Here's a very rare night shot in St. Mary's River of the, uh, either the Snyder Jr. or the Schoonmaker in the ice in the river. Very, very unusual to have night shots in, in this era. Here's a Wesley Harkins image of the boat. Uh, we're trying to find the original of this one, one of my all-time favorite boat photos. This, again, will be this, in this sequel book, all of this marvelous archival material has sort of come out of the woodwork. There's Uncle Polly uh, with the, when the, the Wilpin was cut down after the three watch system, I'm assuming that what, what was driving it after the three watch system came into vogue, uh, the passenger quarters were reduced on the, the Shenango boats and a lot of their, these beautiful interior spaces in the forward end were sort of scrapped out and the, uh, the fireplace uh, wound up in uh, Paul's childhood home. You can see him there as a young fella uh, standing with the furnace of the uh, Shenango, uh, which is now in his home uh, in, in Monroe. And one, as far as, far as contemporary uh, new things to be brought to the table with this new book, I mentioned uh, in, my, in my sort of uh, typical uh, uh, pitch is this idea of I, I felt like I was 
coming to the story with new tools. One new tool, even since I started, is the drone. Uh, and so now you can get these. This is just it's impossible to overstate how complicated this image is or how, how insane, <laughs> risky with a basically a battery powered thousand dollar bill flying out over open Lake Superior in fairly rough weather to get this image. The Overstar, James Overstar, an interlaker now, uh, she was built as the Shenango 2, which was the last boat built for the Shenango Furnace Company in the late 1960s. So she is the living link, if you will, uh, to the, the Shenango story, uh, still trading very actively on the Great Lakes. Uh, and uh, I always like to have a living link in the story because it, it, there's just nothing like a, a real live steamboat still out uh, applying her trade uh, from, from port to port. Last trip on the boat, I'm gonna to have to start moving it along here. I can tell I'm jabbering on too long. So I, I went along tragically, painfully. I knew I had to observe it, it broke my heart, but uh, the news finally came in 2013 that the engine was worn out and the steel in the stern was worn out and it just was becoming financially unsustainable to, to, to keep operating the boat as a steamer. So the decision was made uh, finally to, to uh, convert the hull into an, an articulated tug barge, uh, which, was inevitable. Uh, and, and on the upside, uh, the vessel is still working. Some of the guys are still sailing. Uh, the, the crew from the old days is still sailing on the, on the barge. So uh, if there's any silver lining, uh, that is perhaps it. So here's the last load out of South Chicago. Uh, in uh, This is November of 2013, the last trip uh, heading up. They, to to the, her owner's credit, uh, they sent her to the shipyard to be chopped under her own power. They could have towed her up there, uh, but uh, they sent her. They sent her to the shipyard uh, under steam, which I certainly appreciated. Uh, and I, you know, again, was able to capture these these pictures. Here's the last uh, surf and turf on the boat on the last uh, leg of the trip up uh, up Lake Michigan. Uh, captain uh, George Herdina, who was the captain when I was shooting most of the book, uh, retired and. Uh, uh, although I missed him very much, he was one of my all-time favorite people. Uh, Al Tilke, Captain Al, the sailor's pal, a kind of very colorful captain uh, over the years, took over as her skipper, and uh, he was always a fabulous host, uh, just a, a really uh, fun, <laughs> fun guy. If you look up fun in dictionary, I'm pretty sure you find his, his photograph. He actually cooked the last meal, the final steaks on that last trip. Here's a running up the white flag of surrender coming into the Sturgeon Bay ship canal. And uh, a last look over the shoulder of the wheelsman, a truly you know, an old school wheelsman who really earned his pay wheeling that old boat. And the final engine watch uh, shifting that Skinner for the last time, final notations in the log book, blowing the boilers down for the last time that night uh, when we tied up. And the sun setting uh, on Challenger as a as a steamboat, which was, uh, I think, uh, I shed a tear, and maybe I wasn't alone in that to, to watch the uh, the steam kind of leave for good. Uh, now the next morning, I convinced everyone. There was a lot of complaining and belly aching, but everyone, I said, hey, we've got to get a picture of the last crew. So everybody turned out uh, at the given time. Now I didn't realize it, but Paul had found. Uh, in the attic uh, at Wilton, uh, this photo, uh, actually, I guess I did know it, uh, and I, I could set the photo up now that I think about it, uh, to sort of bookend. So here's the last crew, 107 years on, and then this is the crew of the Snyder in about 1907. Uh, in, uh, now this is at the forward end of the ship, but you can just see that photo uh, really uh, drives home the, uh, <laughs> the tremendous service life that uh, that piece of engineering uh, had, had endured. <laughs> so that, that is a really interesting, I think it's just a really interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, juxtaposition. And there's that pilot house when can't end this without talking about the pilot house. They, they took the pilot off, house off first thing. And it sat in the shipyard for a better part of a year. That's Dave Jarvis, the uh, first assistant. I think he was the chief engineer at this point. Uh, he sort of oversaw the conversion. So there's the, uh, the pilot house on the ground. Here's our former pa passenger guest quarters gutted out. And the death of the after deck house. Uh, this was the boat was repowered in the 50s with the Skinner. And here's the death of the Skinner. And that steam steering engine was originally from 1906. 
gives us the, just the engine casing and the stern slowly melts away. The bow is already gone or the pilot house and the forecastle Texas deck, the uh, engine room went brick by brick. They left the, uh, the keel alone while it was sitting obviously in the slip in the water. Uh, they, so they cut her down that far over the winter. Here's some scenes inside the uh, forward end of the ship, gutted out. There's an aerial view. And then they, over the winter, started fabricating the new, the new steel to make the notch to push the uh, barge. Here she is in the dry dock. And slowly, uh, there's the, the last bit of the tail being chopped off and uh, sort of Frankensteining the old and the new together. And the sponsons finally being put on. So now you've got a full notch there painted up. And there's the Bradshaw. I don't know if it's the McKee right away, but uh, here's the sea trial, day of the sea trial. And you can see that the hull looks great. That hull, that 107 year old hull painted up. Uh, looks, you know, the business end of the boat is still making money. Here she coming to, this is coming in Milwaukee the first time as a barge. Uh, I had to kind of bite down a good deal to, to uh, take these pictures. I'm not a big fan of ATBs as a rule. Picture wise, they are not as interesting as steamboats. And there's the pilot house. Finally, the last part of our story sat there for a year. And then very, I mean, this is just, you couldn't write better fiction. Uh, Interlake very graciously offered to transport the pilot house down to the museum in Toledo. So we uh, uh, were, I was there to witness them uh, putting the boat, uh, putting the pilot house on, on the, the current Queen of the Lakes, uh, sort of the best of the old and the new. And uh, here we are, I got on the boat actually in, in Escanaba, Michigan. We loaded a taconite uh, for the Torco dock there. And uh, this is a view inside the pilot house on, on the uh, deck of the Tregertha. And uh, another view uh, towards the stern, coming down Port Huron off the top of the pilot house uh, roof, coming past Detroit in the dark and uh, coming into Toledo uh, with uh, Captain Thibodeau there at the the helm, I understand he's uh, retiring this year. He was, again, one of my favorite people, just a delightful, uh, very gracious uh, individual. Had some wild weather that night, beautiful kind of uh, appropriate, it seemed. And the next morning, not so much, a lot of fog. In fact, we almost had to call it off. We had to back the, he had to back the boat up to the, uh, to the dock there to offload. And, and the fog was so lousy that, uh, we almost decided, he almost decided to uh, uh, take, a, take a pause, hit the pause button and maybe try it again the next day or later that day. But we made it and uh, here's the crew uh, offloading the pilot house where it sits to this day. And I'll let uh, Chris tell the rest of the story. Uh, we took the bell off and I'll close with this humorous, somewhat humorous anecdote. I happened to be having a barbecue with the first mate uh, when Paul, we had taken the bell off to prevent it from being stolen, and uh, Paul went ahead and, and we were curious if it was the original bell from 1906, and we thought, nah, that can't be the case, that surely that bell got swapped out at some point, and it was painted over so many years, so many coats of paint that you couldn't see, there was no, there was no legible writing on it. Well, Paul, uh, uh, you know, ground the, the paint uh, off 100 years of birth of paint and sure enough it's engraved on the bell is William P. Snyder and uh, so I ran over to Rocky and I thought this would be this big sort of maritime history moment and he was like no uh, that was visible in the 70s he'd been on the boat for like 30 plus years <laughs> so apparently it was at one time it was visible but uh, it had been uh, painted over uh, to a point that it was no longer legible by the time we got our hands on it but uh, that, uh, art, that is quite an artifact and uh, I'm sure it will be proudly displayed in the, uh, in the new exhibit. So I'm gonna shut up because I went way too long there. It's just, there are so many rabbit holes in this story, I can't stop myself. And that's very hard to go in a straight line. So anyhow, I'll leave it there. And uh, thanks uh, to all, one and all for uh, uh, sticking with me uh, to hear about this new uh, wrinkle in the long story of the, uh, of good old hull number 18. Great, thank you so much, Chris. That has been fascinating. I am now going to um, quickly turn it over to uh, our executive director, Christopher Gilchrist, to turn on your video and your microphone. Here he comes. 
and share with us uh, what all of our plans are. So you're at it. All right. Um, you know, following uh, uh, Chris Winters is um, uh, do, following a Chris Winters talk is about the most painful thing that uh, one can do in one's life. And so um, we're just going to talk briefly uh, here about what our plans are uh, for the pilot house. Uh, we're going to talk about our expansion project. Uh, and because, of course, um, at the core of our expansion project is the St. Mary's Challenger Pilot House. It's nice to know that after this boat had uh, all of those years, those, the century of, of work, that two, two parts of the boat, its hull, is still currently operating, and that its pilot house will also go on uh, with a life, but uh, as, uh, as a museum artifact for everyone to enjoy. Um, the, uh, as, as uh, Chris kind of told the story, uh, the pilot house was stored at uh, Bay Ship Building uh, and uh, was brought down to Toledo on the deck of the Paul Tregurtha. Uh, we stored it at Midwest Terminals. This is, um, remember, we had opened the museum in 2014 uh, and this wonderful donation uh, by the owners of the boat of the pilot house was a bit of a surprise. And um, we were still in those first uh, two years of operation uh, where we were really kind of learning our, our place in Toledo. We were learning what kind of audience we were going to get. We were learning um, the cost of electricity at the new site because we had never run it full year round. Uh, so we, 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 we had a lot on our plate in 2015, 2016. Uh, and so when we got the uh, pilot house, uh, Midwest Terminals in, in Toledo graciously agreed uh, to store it for us uh, until we could kind of um, get our, uh, our, our feet firmly uh, uh, entrenched in Toledo and begin the process of uh, figuring out how we were going to use this wonderful, wonderful artifact. Um, our original plan that we began developing in 2018 was to um, include the pilot house as a part of a new larger expansion to the building. Uh, the building is about uh, 15,000 square feet, uh, the museum. Um, when we moved into the building, we made conscious decisions uh, about how much space we would use for display, for exhibits. Um, and one of the things that we uh, decided, and this was going back all the way till about 2012, was that our community room, uh, where often people gather for the annual lecture series before uh, this COVID thing, uh, uh, was that we could use that space for um, uh, lectures, uh, 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 rentals, um, uh, temporary and traveling exhibits. And what we learned from 2014 on uh, to 2018 that that space is, as a multi-purpose space, is just not that effective. Uh, it, it, there are real challenges to uh, effectively using uh, uh, multi-purpose space. And so we began thinking about how uh, we might uh, expand the building so that we could have uh, both a dedicated community room as well as dedicated uh, temporary and traveling exhibit space, along with how would we bring the St. Mary's Challenger into the mix and, and make that uh, 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 a reality. So uh, we, here's a, just a, a, one of our first kind of uh, 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 um, versions of what we thought we might do on the property. Now, the, the goal was always to place the pilot house um, uh, out overlooking the river uh, so that when people came into the pilot house, they would get a flavor of what it was like to be in a pilot house overlooking water. Uh, and so um, that was always the goal, but then we were going to build on to it with uh, temporary and traveling exhibit space, some new office space, because if you've been in our office, the 120 square foot for four people um, is a little cramped, uh, and we were going to retrofit some things. So this was our first, first plan, uh, 2018. We had some um, health issues with some of our uh, board members on the committee, and so that slowed things down a lot, but we began thinking about what, what other things we might do uh, with the project. Um, and then, of course, uh, um, uh, uh, 2020 hits, um, and we decided uh, to um, uh, phase the project. And when I say phase it, we wanted to get the pilot house on the property uh, Midwest Terminals had, had, had was storing it for us. They were being generous, but uh, um, you know th that's an industrial site that has 
lots of uh, bulk material going on it, lots of finished product going on it. And um, we just, we knew it was, uh, had the chance of getting in their way of doing their business. And so we, we wanted to get it on the property and, uh, and we wanted to get the project moving forward. So we said to ourselves, let's get this done as quickly as possible. Uh, and then we'll bring the second part, which would be the building expansion uh, um, um, uh, as we move forward. So uh, um, that's why we're sort of thinking of it in, in just technical terms as a phase one and a phase two. Um, the, of course, I don't need to talk about the historic value of, of uh, uh, the St. Mary's Challenger. Um, we know that this is a wonderful, wonderful, very historic artifact. You know, to, to, to run for all those years, we believe it's the longest uh, continually operated bulk carrier, uh, certainly in the United States, but perhaps even the world. Uh, and uh, so we want it to, um, as an artifact itself, it, it's worthy of presentation. Um, second, it's uh, the, the schoonmaker, one of the schoonmaker's sister ships. So there's a nice connection there. And as uh, 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 Chris has pointed out, there are these, these kind of uh, uh, streams that all come together from different places of different stories of the Shenango Furnace Company and 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 the William P. Snyder and and the the the, the schoonmaker that that make this just a, a nice fit to the property. And then lastly, um, when we were creating the new exhibits in the museum uh, back in 2011, 2012, 2013, uh, we uh, were um, we we knew we couldn't do every topic. And one of the topics uh, that uh, we just, um, we didn't really feel we had an artifact that could support the story was the role of cement carriers uh, on the Great Lakes. And so uh, because the St. Mary's Challenger uh, uh, was a cement boat uh, for much of her history, we thought this pilot house can help tell that important industrial story, which even today is so critical uh, to our, our nation's economy. And so there's a historic value to bring the pilot house uh, to the site and making it available to be seen. Um, but there was also a practical value uh, of bringing it here. Um, here you can see uh, with the photograph of the schoonmaker um, uh, from uh, below its bow, um, that is the ramp leading up to the schoonmaker. That ramp, I can guarantee you, is not ADA approved. Uh, it is way too steep to, um, well, we don't want uh, uh, families with um, baby carriages to pull them up there. Um, it is extremely steep. Um, way back when, there was some thought by the city of Toledo uh, to make the, uh, at least the first deck, the main deck of the Schoonmaker handicap accessible, meaning you could get by wheelchair up a ramp. But when they realized that to get up that 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 to get up to that height, it would have to go uh, three quarters of the way down the uh, uh, length of the hull, and then back and then back again, uh, uh, we decided along with the city that the that this boat was never going to be handicap accessible because once you got to the deck, what were you going to do? You were going to cut every bulkhead. You were going to widen every door. You, it just didn't make practical sense. So, um, uh, so, and you can see on the picture here, it's, it, it is a steep, steep uh, uh, walk up the, the, that gangway. And that, that, the nature of the schoonmaker not being handicap accessible means people who either A, are handicapped, B, are um, uh, uh, physically challenged that, that uh, climbing the, that they, they're, not, they're not in a wheelchair, but they are physically challenged and don't feel they can make it up uh, the gangway. Uh, and third, uh, the people who, um, and you'd be surprised, there are a lot of people who start up that gangway and look down and say, I'm not going up any further, that they never get a chance to experience that pilot house experience. And so for us, the pra one of the practical values of the St. Mary's Challenger, uh, having the pilot house on ground level looking out over the water, was that people would get a chance uh, to get a pilot house experience if they, if they couldn't make the trip all the way to the top of the Schoonmaker. Uh, and that was important to us. Um, there's another issue, which is um, on November 1st, uh, every November 1st, uh, the, uh, the Schoonmaker closes to the public. Uh, our uh, uh, insurance carriers um, uh, look at the deck, look at the weather, look at the possibility of rain on a, 
on a steel deck on a 38 degree day and they say that's going to be a skating rink. Uh, so um, the idea of that, that the Schoonmaker is completely closed from November 1st to April 30th limits what people uh, get to do. They come to the museum and they don't get to go on the boat. Not that the pilot house, uh, the St. Mary's Challenger pilot house will be a complete replacement because we know it's not, uh, but it at least still, uh, when we finish the project, they will be able to go and get that pilot house experience uh, year round. And so there's a practical value uh, uh, to this first phase as well. So our plan is to bring the uh, St. Mary's Pilot House uh, to the property. Uh, we're gonna build a foundation that can hold the weight of the Pilot House uh, right on the uh, corner here uh, of the, uh, um, there's a, a wall here and about an eight foot drop down to the dock. And so the Pilot House will be right up uh, uh, close to the edge of the wall so that people standing in the Pilot House will be out looking over the Maumee River. If they turn to their left, they'll see the Tug Ohio and a little bit of the Schoonmaker, uh, you know, from, from that perspective. Um, looking straight ahead, they're looking at the Craig Street Bridge and the new um, uh, US 280 Bridge. Uh, so they get a, a, get a sense of that, uh, uh, of uh, uh, being on the water in the Pilot House. Um, we, we, once we get it to the site, uh, our goal is to uh, restore it. It has been sitting up at Midwest Terminals for uh, uh, almost uh, six years. And uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, actually it's about four years it's been up there. Um, the, uh, uh, but we have looked at it. It's not in bad condition. There's some uh, kind of uh, 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 cleaning of it. Uh, there's going to be a little work on the uh, roof of the pilot house uh, to ensure that uh, um, water doesn't come in. There's probably a few small leaks up there. A window has to be replaced, um, but probably sandblasting and uh, repainting it, uh, getting it to, to look uh, as good as our two other uh, museum ships. And you can see from the uh, satellite image, that's where the boat will ultimately, the, the pilot house will ultimately be positioned. Uh, how will we use it? Uh, you know, um, until we get the expansion completed of everything else, we'll probably do time docent led tours of it. Uh, you know, maybe uh, during the weekends, three or four a day, uh, where people can go out and we can tell the, the, uh, uh, some more on the Shenango story, but also really hit the uh, importance of the cement uh, carrier story in St. Mary's, uh, the St. Mary's Cement Company, uh, and really describe what Chris has laid out to you is what, because this, this pilot house is exactly like it was the day, the last day the boat sailed. And so to really tell that story uh, of, of uh, uh, what a pilot house was just relatively recently, uh, but, but that a pilot house that has a, a 109 year history. Um, specialty tours, uh, groups that want to specifically see that, that set it up ahead of time. And then also, of course, special events at the museum, we would open it up uh, uh, for, for those experiences as well. Um, this just gives you uh, what our phase two, which we think will follow very quickly after our phase one of getting the pilot house. This is what we've settled on. You can see here the pilot house uh, is, is right at the edge here. Um, we are going to do um, a, a, an exhibit area right immediately adjacent to the pilot house that will uh, stress um, the St. Mary cement story and cement carriers and the history of the boat uh, over or so models that tell different stories about uh, the experiences of the people on the boat, the people who built those boats, different really good stories that haven't really been flushed out uh, as well as we would like in our, in our permanent exhibit, with ultimately the end story being the story of the St. Mary's Challenger, this, this wonderful story as, as Chris has li uh, lined up for us tonight. And then, of course, uh, changing exhibit galleries uh, along here and some new office space and, and community room space that are that will be a new build and, and retrofit. So, um, you know, this is a really exciting project for us. Um, it's our first major expansion of the building. Uh, as I said, the St. Mary's Challenger Pilot House is our kind of first phase that will, will help kick off the second phase. 
uh, but um, we hope that in the next uh, uh, one between when we get this done, hopefully, and in, in, uh, we'll have it in place and, and maybe even open to the public um, by uh, the end of this year, uh, but perhaps uh, spring of next year. Um, uh, uh, and then uh, shortly thereafter, another year and a half, two years, maybe we'll have the whole thing done. So we uh, hope that everyone uh, has the opportunity to come and, and see this and experience this pilot house. Uh, and this rich, rich, rich history that uh, uh, Chris uh, has uh, so wonderfully, wonderfully told tonight. So um, with that, uh, I think Carrie is going to jump back in uh, and uh, we are going to uh, um, have questions. Yes, if I could have Chris Winters come back on as well. Uh, while we wait for Chris Winters, we've got uh, one question from Don Lee for you, Chris. Uh, will you announce in advance the moving of the pilot house to the museum? I, I um, think Don would like to come watch this be put on place, would be my guess. I am, you know, um, uh, we anticipate our goal is to bring the pilot house by water uh, uh, because it is right at, uh, it can be quickly put on a barge and brought down. Um, I would I would defer to Paul Lamar on that. Um, uh, I'm sure it will. Be, I, I'm sure we will. Uh, but there's always technical issues uh, uh, about when that can happen, and and uh, Coast Guard issues. And um, um, the the short answer is yes, but perhaps no. Uh, in, in case um, uh, something uh, 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 prevents us that. Uh, the Coast Guard doesn't want a lot of people in boats out there taking pictures while this thing is being brought down. Uh, I, I would defer to Paul on that because he is the, um, uh, the he's moved one boat already uh, uh, on the Maumee River and that was a, we swore we would never do that again, but now we're moving a pilot house by water. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to kind of see how that day goes. Oh, here, Paul says, if we put 200 people on the schooner maker during the move, we can let people know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's done um uh, we've got some other things here mostly for mr winters who has is still on the line but has not come back on line yet or back in person yet um i will tell you there's uh austin herdina is here and apparently he's sitting with his dad george herdina which chris mentioned um, as one of his favorite people, and George says that Chris is also one of his favorite people. Um, George also believes he's the only person to ever work on both the Challenger and the Schoonmaker. Not entirely sure how you can verify it, but he, th you know, he definitely did work on both of those. So he's got to be a few people there. And there we go, Chris, and he's got a guest. Hey. <laughs> this is Ryerson. <laughs> In case anyone doubts my commitment to this, here, <laughs> here's the proof. <laughs> So, uh, Chris, did you hear what I, I had to say from went from George? I, I yes, uh, I was uh, making some dinner and I came running back in. So, yeah. hi, Cap. How are <laughs> nice to see you talk uh, uh, virtually uh, again. Okay. Well, we've got um, quite a few here. Um, uh, I had somebody who um, right at the very beginning. Uh, the uh, Ellen's grandfather was a fireman boiler in the 1930s on the Snyder. Uh, is do you, can you talk about that job at all? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> that was a yes, uh, certainly a. Uh, well, now probably you'd have a hard time to find uh, someone to do that job. Uh, boats in that era were steam driven, and uh, the engines were uh, uh, fired by coal, coal fired. Uh, boilers and uh, firing a boiler sounds easily enough as if to say you just shovel coal in the boiler and the boat goes well it's a lot more complicated than that and uh, it's a hot messy job and of course if it was bad weather uh, you were rolling around uh, in the coal uh, trying to keep the most important thing you need to do in bad weather uh, in, in a storm big storm especially is keep the the engine chugging along so uh, firing that boiler was uh, a very critical, but uh, highly unpleasant uh, job. Um, and apparently you were just name calling everybody because Al Pilkey is also on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I did. Uh, Jess sends her best. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, uh, let's see, uh, 
Keith Yearman asks, there was a lithograph made of the Medusa Challenger and they had a copy hanging in the lounge area of the ship. Do you know anything about the lithograph? Maybe how many were made? Anything about that? Yes, you know, it's funny. I do, I cannot, I'd have to dredge up. I'd have to go back into my files. Uh, I can picture it in my head. Uh, I cannot dredge up out of, out of, out of my head. Who, who was the artist? Uh, who, uh, that did that. I, I'd have to, I can, if you can get me some of your contact information, I can well, probably. That's that what out. I was just going to say. What I may do is send that to you as a question. And then yeah. when we send out our end of the event email, um, hopefully we'll have an answer by then. So I'll definitely make sure we, we ask about that. Um, Ellen, who was asking about her grandfather and what he was doing, wants to know, um, or maybe within some of that Shenango stuff that you found in other years, are there crew lists? out there for we'll go with the challenger under her six names <laughs> yeah it's possible um there's a fellow named russ plum who has uh, collated a lot of information about crew, crew i'm not quite sure his methods or where he's getting the information but it's remarkable he's helped me with several things it is i don't know that paul has drilled down all the way either at wilpen in terms of what's actually all there uh, we've just sort of skimmed it as I, I think, unless he's done more work that I'm not familiar with. So uh, it's possible, certainly, if we would uh, come across such a thing, uh, I'd be happy to, to share that uh, that information. Okay. Oh, and here's a great idea, other Chris, that we're going back to, which is maybe we can live stream them moving and setting the pilot house down. So now that we are in the live streaming zoom business we will make that happen for sure absolutely <laughs> um rod burdick wants to know was there ever any talk of the challenger being re-engined with a diesel well no <laughs> flatly no uh the the that counter stern the steel was old and brittle and it was not going to pass abs inspection forever and uh i recall very clearly um when I was working on the book, it occurred to me that, well, I got wind that they were already doing the engineering to uh, notch the boat. And Hannah was a tug company. It wasn't really a, a, a steamship company. And uh, I was sweating it. This was nine, year 99, right? My whole hook was the centennial thing. It sounded more and more like they were going to let the boat go um, 99 and three quarters. And then it was going to go in the shipyard and they were going to notch it. The thing that saved it was, interestingly enough, it was Hurricane Katrina. All of a sudden, diesel fuel shot up to three dollars a gallon, doubled in price or more. And so I was at a, an event in Duluth, and uh, Pat O'Hearn, who was the president of Bay Shipbuilding at that time, I recall him coming up to me in confidence and saying, and "That was the first. The Challenger conversion was the first thing he worked on when he started with the company in the late six and mid '60s." So he was very fond of Challenger. And uh, so he said, you're, you know, they're not gonna do it. They decided to, to shelve the conversion for now. And uh, so I, I heaved a huge sigh of relief. And so they, you know, with the bunker uh, sea fuel, heavy fuel being relatively inexpensive, they, uh, you know, set sailed her as a steamer as long as they could. And then finally it was just, again, uh, that engine and, and the, the electrical system and the steel and the stern it was all getting to a point where it was just that it was it was time and uh so and as far as i know there there was I'm, I'm sure they looked at it but there was never any serious uh consideration of, of dieselizing the boat so here's another uh, a more historical question from gerald wanting to know uh what was the challengers well whatever it was named at the time experience in the armistice day storm of 1940 or was it in port or do you even know where she was at the time? Mm, can't say. Don't know that there's any well-documented, uh, I've never come up, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'm sure they were out in about one year. They, they were given up for lost once. Uh, they were due here in Milwaukee in the 40s, I think it was. It wasn't the Armistice Day storm or the Great Storm. Uh, but they were given up for loss. They were overdue two or three days and then came out of, you know, they were anchored behind some island or other and, and uh, popped back up. But uh, I have, uh, and Paul Lamar might know more. Uh, he's the real uh, Shenango uh, 
uh, the, the high priest of, of Shenango. So, so may, maybe there are accounts. Certainly, there were like a, lot, a number of the Cleveland Cliffs captains wrote accounts of uh, in the great storm of 1913, uh, their experiences. Uh, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have a more concrete answer for you, but I, I'm not aware of, of any such thing. No, that's okay. Um, we're hitting towards the 8.30, so I've got two questions I'm gonna kind of fold into one for you, Chris, um, which is, A, how is the second book coming, the sequel coming? And then along with that, and can you maybe include, um, What's your single most favorite memory of your time aboard the Challenger is? Mm, um, well, the book, this is a long, uh, you know, anyone who knows how I work, it could be 10 more years in terms of the sequel project. I, I uh, but from a practical standpoint, I have another book which was supposed to be out already and was derailed, of course, by our fabulous pandemic. So I, I really have to, I owe it to myself to finish that one first. And then I've got a couple of other things sort of lined up and the story doesn't end until the pilot house is installed as an, an, an fully functional as an exhibit so there is some shooting which i'm kind of pumped about i like doing the, the for me the favorite thing is the actual picture taking not all the rest of the crap so i'm pretty excited about uh, observing that process of, 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 of creating the exhibit and that will be the the end of the story so i'm guessing it'd be five years minimally before this book exists Okay. And your favorite memory? Oh, uh, Christmas Eve, 2004. Uh, I met the boat late. I got lost in South Chicago. Probably the only reason I'm alive. I got, got lost in, in the projects in South Chicago, trying to the dock there. Getting to the dock is very complicated. It's the first time I've ever, I ever went down to the dock in South Chicago. The only reason I'm pretty sure I'm still alive is it was Christmas Eve. So I didn't, I didn't get shot. And uh, it was just a perfectly clear, starry night. It was very cold, it was below zero and a steamboat is never more alive than when it's below zero, it's just steam pouring off. And at that time, the boat unloaded into the CTC number one, which is another classic sort of World War II era lake boat. So the Challenger kind of pulled in, I was waiting my camera and I, I shot the boat all the way down the river in this very solitary, sort of state uh, all everyone every every normal person was with their family <laughs> with their families on christmas eve i was out chasing the challenger in the freezing cold and uh it was just a one of those moments it both kind of came out of the lake steam into the river and and uh the, the air is very clear when it's very cold and uh it was just an unforgettable christmas and there was one guy who came down with the groceries for the next day and it's red coat and uh, it's just this solitary, the image is in the book, just this solitary figure in a red coat on Christmas Eve. And uh, that has stayed with me all these years. Excellent, that's, that's wonderful, thank you. Um, and like I said, we've got a couple more, but I'll send those to you. It is 8.30, so we kind of want to wrap up. So yes. thank you both. The kids are hungry, I'm gonna be in big trouble. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Um, for those of you that ordered the Centennial book uh, with your, uh, Registration through Eventbrite. We're going to be sending those out tomorrow. We received those in the mail from Chris and they are all signed. If you are interested in ordering the book, um, still it is at our online store. And because he was so very kind, he sent us some extras that are also signed. So uh, if this has piqued your interest and you're interested in his book, please feel free to, to um, look at those uh, at, at, on our nmglstore.org. Yes, Chris Gilchrist. Just, just a quick note, uh, for those of you who uh, might not uh, be real familiar with Chris Winter's uh, book and his work in general, um, and this is, yes, a shameless plug to, for you to buy the book, but I, I will tell you, uh, um, uh, 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 Pesha may have been the uh, premier Great Lakes photographer of the 20th century. Uh, Chris Winters will be known as the premier photographer of the Great Lakes in the 21st century. And so it, it, this is the ultimate coffee table book. And it's the stories just, the stories come out of the images. There's, you don't, you, you could have just had the images in here, nothing else. The stories jump off the page. And so uh, it's one of, I think it's one of the finest uh, uh, Great Lakes photography uh, 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 products ever, ever made. So uh, buy that book. And congratulations to those who bought it. You got something really special. <laughs> 
All right, thanks. Um, so this is the end of our spring lecture series. Uh, we will be continuing into the fall and I am working very hard to try and do some kind of hybrid where we're a live and a streaming based component. So hopefully all of you can continue to be with us um, when we move into the fall. Uh, until then, please, if you have a chance, come visit us. The Colonel James M. Schoonmaker Museum ship in the Tug, Ohio are now open for the season. We are finally planning some limited in-person programming, including the return of the Captain Scuppers Kids Club, as well as introducing a new program called History Happy Hour. And just to call out one more thing that Chris had put in his presentation, uh, he mentioned those beautiful pictures of the Schoonmaker when she was being moved were taken by um, Jim Hoffman. We will be having an exhibit starting in mid-July highlighting Mr. Hoffman's photography of Great Lakes boats in and around the Toledo area. So please be sure to come and see that when that goes up. Don't forget, if you aren't a member, now is a great time to join at nmgl.org backslash membership. And we hope to see you all here in Toledo or in the Zoom world soon. Thanks again, Chris, for your time and serious expertise tonight. And to all of you that have been with us tonight. So stay safe and stay healthy and have a great evening. Thank you.